cry out this evening, holy is the Lord. God Almighty, the earth is filled with his glory. We stand and lift up our hands, for the joy of the Lord is our strength. You may be seated. I join with Daryl in welcoming you tonight. We're so thankful to have you with us. Our pastor is fixing to come and share with us from God's Word. Encourage you to open your Bible, start turning to Isaiah 6 after we pray, okay? We're going to pray first. But uh, I'm looking forward to the message. Brother Don, this is uh, one of uh, many of our favorite passages from one of the Old Testament prophets, Isaiah when he saw that wonderful vision of the Lord. So just prepare your hearts for worship. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you tonight for the privilege of being here together with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Father, we thank you for midweek services. Lord, we know in the world we live in, we need refreshing, we need encouragement, we need a reminder of your greatness and your glory. And we pray for our pastor now as he'll come and share from your word. In Jesus' name, amen.
Isaiah chapter 6, as Mike said, it's a most familiar passage. It's quoted. It's, uh, it's read. Um, of all of the messages I have ever preached from Isaiah, I have probably spoken from these eight verses more than uh, any other passage. But I want to tie this together with last week's message, and uh, I'll give you just a little background before we read chapter 6 and the first eight verses. The times of Isaiah were troublesome and turbulent times for the nation of Israel. Captivity was on the horizon. Idolatry was uh, ever increasing. And although the southern kingdom had a godly king named Uzziah, who had reigned for 52 years, he's going to die in chapter 6, and the nation is going to be plunged once again into the lowest of spiritual states. Isaiah is somewhat comfortable as a prophet because he's become accustomed to the leadership of Uzziah 52 years. And it seems as if the whole nation has simply begun to drift in a wayward condition. If you'll remember in chapter 1, God makes accusation. He, he complains about the people. He says to them that the animals of the field are more intelligent than my people Israel because they know who their creator was. He calls him in chapter 1 a sinful nation a people laden down with iniquity, a people who are so burdened and so broken and so bent that they cannot get around because of the evil in their lives. He says they are corrupt. They've forsaken the Lord and despised the Holy One of Israel. In fact, he calls them utterly estranged. And that's a word we're familiar with today, meaning that once was a friendship and now it has been broken and there no longer is any friendship, fellowship, even relationship. There is an estrangement there. He says their head is sick. And then he specifically says about the land that the land lies desolate and the cities are being burned with fire and foreigners have devoured the land, meaning the Amalekites and the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Jebusites and all the other nations that should have been conquered. He was commanded, Joshua was commanded to take the nation of Israel into the promised land and destroy all of the enemy, conquer them. But instead of conquering them, they enslaved them. And after a while, things reversed. And those nations that had been enslaved became masters once again of the nation of Israel. He even says you need to hear the word of the Lord. If it was not for a small remnant, God would have turned you, Israel, over to your evil and corrupt ways long ago. And then particularly, I want you to remember the 18th verse where God gives them an incredible invitation. A holy and righteous God says to a sinful and evil-laden people, come now, let us reason together. Though your sins be like scarlet, they can be like white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they can become pure and soft like wool. An incredible invitation for a holy God to invite a evil and sinful people into his presence to reason with him. Now, the reason I wanted to go back to chapter 1 before we get to chapter 6 is because that word reason needs good explanation. It is not that God said, come and let's sit down at a conference table and talk over your sinfulness and you explain to me why you don't see all that much wrong. It's not that he said, let's argue about this or debate this. It's not that God said, I see it one way and you see it another way and maybe we ought to compromise. 
Those are not at all the meanings that this word reasoning has. What God is saying to Israel is, you are a wicked and sinful and evil-laden nation. Come into my presence and agree with me. Make sure you understand that this is not a debate, that there are not options, that there is no neutrality here. Make sure you understand that the verdict has already been decided. You are guilty of idolatry and wickedness and sinfulness. And your only option is to come into my presence and say, Oh God, you're right. I am sinful. I have sinned against you. I do need to reason with you. I do need my stained life as dark as scarlet and red like crimson. I do need it washed in the blood of the Lamb. I do need it cleansed. I can only be right, Lord, if you make me right. I am unrighteous, you are righteous. I am unholy, you are holy, and I agree with you, God. And I said last week, and will say as I introduce chapter 6, that is the only means of revival. God is not interested in talking over our sin and discussing with us how we can choose option one, two, or three. God is not interested with us explaining to him why we don't feel like it's as bad as he says it is. God is not about to change. He is a changeless God. He is a sovereign God. He is a holy God. He is a righteous God. And thousands of years have come and gone. But listen to me. If it was wrong then, it's wrong now. If God said no then, God's still saying no. God does not change his mind. He does not relent about his convictions. We're not going to talk God into favorable circumstances. We're going to agree with him. I am a sinner I need a Savior, and even as one who is redeemed and saved, I still sin, and I need an advocate who will go before me and help me confess my sin that I might be forgiven and cleansed of all unrighteousness. Now, with that in mind, let's look at chapter 6, verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face. With two he covered his feet. And with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. A reference to the temple. And he said, Woe is me, for I am lost. Hebrew word, I am a wanderer. I have drifted, not lost in that he needed to be saved, lost in that he could not and did not find his way to the holiness of God. I am a wanderer. I am lost. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar in the temple. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am. Send me. Father, cause this passage of Scripture to just come to life for these next few moments that we might place ourselves in the position Isaiah found himself in so that our hearts can be confessed of sin, repented of, and forgiven and cleansed. In Jesus' name, amen. 
He was a godly king, but Uzziah did not finish strong. For in the latter portion of his ministry as a king of his reign of 52 years, he offered incense in the temple in an improper way. He was not a priest. He was a king. And as a result of that, God gave him leprosy. So the season of prosperity in Israel had begun to wane. And the people were comfortable in their condition. And so when God says in chapter 1, here is where I find you. This is what I see in you. Come now, let us reason together. He's already extended an invitation. He's already encouraged them to make things right. Some time goes by before we arrive at chapter 6. And in chapter 6, two dramatic circumstances take place. The king dies. And there is grieving and mourning in the land because King Uzziah was a loved king. He was a beloved king. He was a blessed king. He had led Israel in great prosperity. But another thing happened. Isaiah began to see that even though the earthly king had died, the heavenly king was very much alive on his throne, high and lifted up. We ought to take note of that tonight. As we look about us, a lot of things have died. It seems that we are not the nation we once were. Much has died. Love, in some cases, have died. Morals have certainly died in many areas. But there is a king who is still alive, who is high, and lift it up. And what do you do when the earthly king dies? You regret it. You mourn over it. You wish it hadn't happened. But you immediately turn your eyes on the heavenly king. For he alone has always been our only hope. There is no other man save Christ Jesus. Who is both savior, king, and and Lord of all. So let's look for a moment. We need to see what Isaiah saw. Chapter 6, the first few verses, Isaiah gets this picture, this image of a sovereign God who reigns eternal. He sees God in his majestic holiness, in his righteousness, in his lofty and exalted position. Now, I want to tell you that there are a lot of people who might disagree with me, and they have every right to be wrong, so just hear what I'm about to say. The purpose of the church, while there is a great commission, and we're certainly to witness and win and baptize and disciple, while there are dozens of one another's, Confess your faults to one another. Pray for one another. Love one another. While there is much in the Scripture that we are commanded to do and to be, our primary focus is the worship of our living God. And when we begin to do anything else but make that our primary focus, then the main thing is no longer the main thing. And what it appears to be in this passage that I've read in your hearing tonight is that the nation of Israel and even Isaiah, the prophet of God, had let that slip. He said, I'm lost. I'm a wanderer. I've drifted away from the main point. I've let myself get comfortable and relaxed in my relationship. And so all of a sudden, he turns his eyes back upon the heavens, and he sees the magnificence of God and the mightiness of God and the purity of God and the holiness of God. He sees God in the position that God is in. And by the way, He's in the same position he's always been in. He's high and lifted up. He's on his throne. And no matter how many earthly kings die, God is always on his throne. And that's how Isaiah sees him. He not only sees his position, he sees his personality. And I've mentioned this, but he he hears what the angels say. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth, the whole world is full of his glory. 
We don't always see that. We don't always catch a glimpse of the glory of God in everything that we see. But God's glory is everywhere and in everything. He's a glorious God. He made the sunrise and the sunset so that we could marvel at the beauty of what he can do. He makes it rain or snow. He makes the grass to grow. He makes the ponds and the lakes and the streams and the rivers and the ocean. He allows a little baby to be born into this world that we can marvel that in a six or seven pound infant, there is that kind of energy and life. God is a marvelous God. And Isaiah began to see his position. He's holy. If you were to name all the characteristics of God, I think right at the top of the list, you'd have to put holy. That's what makes him God. I know he's loving, but some of us are loving. Not so much like God, but we're loving. But none of us are holy. We long to be. Hallelujah, one day we will be. But right now, the only righteousness I have or you have is the imputed and imparted righteousness of Christ that God gave to me. There's nothing in me that's holy. But God's primary characteristic is that he is a holy God. And when you contrast good, that's what some of us are, with holy, good becomes dark and evil in comparison. We serve a holy God. And then he saw his presence. When he saw him walking about and the train of his robe filled the temple. Not to compare, but to give illustration. We've had through the years some beautiful weddings here at our church. And I always think that the most special moment in any wedding and you may disagree, but it's when those back doors open and the music begins to play and the bride's mother stands up and here comes the bride. And behind her, normally, there is a train. And as she walks, she will never be more beautiful to the groom nor to those who watch. She's coming to be united in marriage. Isaiah caught something similar to that. The robe of righteousness. The glitter of glory. The Shekinah glory of God that filled the house with smoke. So much so that the priest could not minister. That one could not look at another. Like every eye turned upon the bride walking down the aisle. All of the angelic beings had turned to the one who was sitting on the throne, and they began to cry out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. You can't look anywhere, they said, without seeing his glory. His splendor is in abundance. His majesty is everywhere. The Shekinah glory of God covers his whole creation. He saw his presence. The second thing is we need to sense what Isaiah sensed. And the first thing that Isaiah sensed was something's wrong with me. He looked at God. And in the look, he saw his own reflection. He saw himself as a man who was wayward, lost, a man of unclean lips. Now, later when the angel takes the coal off the altar and touches his lips, it is in response to him declaring, I'm a man of unclean lips. It doesn't mean that you're forgiven if you say the right thing. It means that his lips was the opening for the thoughts of his heart and mind to come out of. What Vance Havner said, what's down in the well will eventually come up in the bucket, and that's what's true of the lips. You can't be around anybody for very long without being able to tell if that person knows Jesus Christ as a personal Savior, if they're filled with vulgarities and off-color insinuations 
you wonder immediately. Somebody that loves Jesus with all of his heart and soul and mind won't be able to talk to you long without telling you something of the glories of his God. Angels cried, holy, holy, holy. And Isaiah said, oh, may it's been a while since I praised the Lord. It's been a while since I cried, holy, holy, holy. It's been a while since I saw him in all of his radiance and, and all of his majesty. Now, I've been in ministry long enough to know that ever how many people there are here tonight, that's how many worship styles we have. Some of you worship quietly and silently, but it does not mean you don't worship. Some of you will rise to your feet quickly during a song, and some of you will clap during a sermon, and some of you like to lift your hands. As long as your heart and your head are correct, you do whatever you choose with your hand. Don't let it be a show. Let it be an act of real worship. But here's what I'm going to say. Isaiah had strayed from the pathway of true worship. And it is when he sees the earthly king has died and he's about ready to throw in the towel and then he hears, holy, 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 and he looks and he says to himself, oh my, I've had my eyes in the wrong place. I'm saddened by what's happened on this earth, but I am gladdened by what I see in the heavens. This whole earth is not shattered by the death of Uzziah. This whole earth is filled with the glory of God. And then he said, he's high and holy and holy and holy. And that means I'm a prophet doing God's work, but I'm a prophet in desperate need of revival. I think that our worst sin these days, especially among us who try to keep our morals in check, I think our worst sin is the sin of judging others and blaming others. I find that to be true in my life, and I've repented of it quite often lately. I think it's easy for us who don't rob banks and who don't murder people and who don't riot and who don't rape and who don't do those sins of the hands. I think it's easy for us to sit back sometime and say, look at them, watch them, see what they do. But here's a lesson from Isaiah. Leave them out of it until you include yourself in it. Now, he came to the fact that he was a man of unclean lips and he dwelt in the midst of a people of unclean lips. But we only have a right to see sin in others when we have seen sin in ourselves. We only have a right to say to someone else, he's a holy God and we need revival and repentance when we ourselves have seen him as a holy God and we have repented and been revived. He saw his own condition. And then he owned his own cleansing. You know, God is so good to point sin out. Now, you may not understand that because if I point your sin out, sometimes it's because I'm trying to make myself look better than you. And if you point out my sin, the same could be true of you. But you know why God is so good to point out sin? Because sin robs us of his presence. It robs us of his provisions. It robs us of peace because sin separates us in our fellowship with God. Because sin hurts us. And so he's good to point it out. But he's not only good to point out our sin, he's good to point out the remedy for our sin. All the way into 1 John, the end of the New Testament, John declares, if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to 
forgive our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So from the first of Genesis where he covered Adam and Eve with a protective covering and hid their sin to the last of the revelation where he shows us how to be washed in the blood of the Lamb and cleansed of all sin where he declares he's a holy advocate and a high priest and one that makes intercession for us that we don't even know how to make for ourselves. Throughout all of that, the God who points out sin provides cleansing for that sin. Come now, let us reason together, though your sin be like scarlet. I can, I will make it white as snow. One other thing, we not only need to see what he saw and sense what he sensed, it would be good for us to say what he said. Verse 8, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Now, Isaiah was already a called prophet. He'd already been given a message to preach. He'd already been given the assignment of warning Israel of the repercussions of continuing on in idolatry. But this is a new calling in his life. This is a, a new measure of commitment that God is calling for. So don't tell me I, I was saved in Bible school when I was 10, and I dedicated my life to the Lord when I was a teenager, and so I don't ever have to do that again. I want to be honest with you. You need to dedicate yourself to the Lord every morning when you wake up and put your feet off the bed. And every night when you lay down, you need to thank God for that day and ask him if he gives you another day to help you to serve him more effectively the next day than you did this day. So Isaiah's not doing anything that's not biblical. He's doing exactly what he ought to do. He is having a refresher course in repentance and in revival. He's coming back to the heart of God. He's coming back to the place of worship. He's seeing God in his holiness and in his might and in his glory. And he is saying, Lord, if you're asking who you can send and who will go, I'm available. And that's what he said. I'm available. Now, tie that back together with chapter 1. I want you to keep this in mind. Chapter 1, he said, all I want you to do is come and reason with me. I don't want to hear your excuse for sin. I don't want you to tell me why I need to be a little bit lighter on you. I don't want you to blame somebody else and say that's what the cause is. I want you to come before me and say, Lord, you're right. I'm wrong. I need a revival. I'm available. And what happens in chapter 1 is now reflected in chapter 6. Isaiah said, Lord, if you're looking for somebody to send, and here's what I really like about it. He didn't say within driving distance of Conway. Used to see that all the time. Love to preach, just as long as it's within driving distance of Conway. I'm telling you, things have changed in 50-something years because driving distance of Conway was Texas and Louisiana and deep Mississippi and Florida and Missouri and any place I could find and every place I could find when I was first called to preach. And that's what Isaiah is saying here. He said, Lord, I'm not asking you what you're going to say to me. I'm not asking where you're going to send me. I'm just telling you I'm available. And the best ability that we have is not our ability. It's our availability. It's our dependability. It's us saying to God, I'm available. And then he's saying to God, I'm agreeable. Send me. Lord, here I am. Send me. I'm agreeable. I'm willing to be what you're asking of me. I'm willing to do what you're asking of me. If you were to keep reading in this chapter... Here is the saddest of all stories. God says to him, okay, you're going to go and you're going to prophesy to your people. Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but you won't perceive. The people's heart is going to be dull. Their ears are going to be heavy. Their eyes are going to be blind. And they will not see with their eyes or hear with their ears or understand with their hearts. And they will not turn and be healed. Well, suppose God called you to ministry. And he said to you, I'm going to give you a church. I'm going to give you a nice size church. I'm going to give you a church where hundreds of people show up every Sunday morning. But I'm going to tell you, you're going to pastor that church for 25, 30, 35, 40 years. Not one person is ever going to join. 
Not one person's ever going to say, be saved. Nobody's ever come into the altar to pray. Nobody's ever going to come out the door and say, you blessed me, you enjoyed, I enjoyed that. Not one time are you going to feel an earthly reward for what you do. How do you feel about that? Be pretty disappointing. Make you kind of feel like Noah. Preach for 120 years and could barely get your own family on the ark. Well, that's exactly what he's saying to Isaiah. You're going to prophesy the truth because you've seen me as a holy God. But unfortunately, the people's eyes are so blind that they cannot see me as a holy God. Their ears are so deaf that they cannot hear angels crying, holy, holy, holy. Their hearts are so hard that they cannot be broken and compassionate and burdened and repentant of sin. God help us tonight. The worst thing in the world is to be lost without Jesus. The next worst thing in the world is to be a Christian who's forgotten. Forgotten grace. Forgotten glory. Forgotten God's call on your life. Forgotten a covenant that he made with you. Forgotten that he's holy and you need to be available and you need to be agreeable. So if there's someone here tonight or someone watching by way of live stream who has forgotten, then the challenge of the evening is very simple. Remember from whence you have fallen and repent and do again the first works. It's what Jesus said to the church at Ephesus. It's what the scriptures say to each one of us. Come now, let us reason together. Your, your life is stained with sin, but I can make it white as snow. It's red like crimson, but I can make it pure like wool. Holy, holy, holy. Lord, here I am. I see you. I hear you. I know you. I am ready to serve you and worship you. Let's pray. Thank you for our time together, for the reminder from Scripture that you are available to us when we are agreeable with you. And as much as lies within us just now, we come before you to agree that we're sinners, that we need to confess our sin, that we need to repent of our sin, that we need forgiveness from our sin, and that some of us need deliverance from strongholds and areas of trials and temptations where we often yield. Lord, make us available and agreeable with the evidence that you have so that the promises that you make will become real in our lives. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.